24-year-old Janik Paul Piatschak was born in Poland and emigrated to the U.S. at the age of 10. His family settled in Brooklyn, New York. He joined the Marines in 2003 as a helicopter mechanic in Iraq. After his return, he married 26-year-old Kiana Jenkins. Kiana grew up in the San Bernardino area of California and graduated in 2005 from San Diego State University. She met Jan through a mutual friend at university while earning a master's degree in public health. She then worked as a counselor for the local Black Infant Care Center with aspirations of studying to become an anesthesiologist. At first, she was reluctant to date a Marine, but Jan's charm won her over and they married on August 8, 2008. They eventually bought a house together in May in Winchester, which was near Temecula, California, and also near Camp Pendleton, a Marine base that he supervised. Jan resumed his work at the Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. On this Wednesday, Jan didn't show up for work. His supervisor called his cell phone without any success. After trying his phone a few more times, his supervisor suspected something was wrong as this was out of the ordinary for Jan. He then called the police at 9 a.m., but on the other end, Kiana also did not show up for work. Her concerned supervisor also called the police, and so they decided to check in on the house. Upon arriving at their house, deputies noticed that the front door was left open. At the front door was a purse that was dumped on the floor and an open cabinet door. The house smelled of natural gas and gasoline. As they continued to enter, they noticed the dead bodies of Jan and Kiana in the living room. There were no obvious signs of forced entry aside from a removed screen from a kitchen window on the ground. There were numerous shoe prints found throughout the house, indicating that there was more than one person. A knife was also at the center of the table in the living room with open alcohol bottles on the floor. Jan had dripping blood stains on his knees and legs and was bleeding from his head. He appeared to have been assaulted before he was shot as they noticed bruising on his right side and back that had a shoe pattern. Both of his wrists and ankles were bound with red duct tape. A sock had also been placed in his mouth and secured, and he was shot once at close range. Kiana was found naked with her wrists bound the same way. A sock was placed over her eyes and secured by tape with another piece at her chin area. A v and red candle were found between her legs and a C was spray painted on her stomach. She was also shot at close range. Upstairs, they found a nightgown with the straps cut off, the packaging for the vibrator, the roll of duct tape, and their small dog in the master bedroom. The room appeared to be ransacked with drawers opened and clothes all over the floor. The jewelry box in the master bedroom was missing and no wedding rings were found on the couple. There were no fingerprints found in the house and it appeared that the intruders attempted to burn the house down as there was ignitable liquid found all over the floors and on Jan and Kiana. There was also several burn areas on the carpets and the gas knobs on the kitchen stove were turned on. Deputies also found an alarm system in their house that was working properly at the time of the murders. The keypads for the alarm system were in the master bedroom and in the kitchen area. If a window or door was broken, a loud siren would have sounded. If the front door had been opened, there would have been a 30 to 45 second delay to turn the system off before the alarm would sound. There were also photographs of the couple in the entryway of their house. At 3.30 a.m. that same morning, they discovered that money was withdrawn from the couple's joint bank account at an ATM nearby. A pin would have been required to make the withdrawals. 
Surveillance video showed a person wearing a blue bandana over their face and gloves with the word mechanics on them, withdrawing several hundreds before covering the camera with their hand. Their autopsies revealed that Kiana had a gunshot wound to the upper back of her neck at close range. Another gunshot wound entered the right side of her forehead and through her skull and brain, which was fatal. She was also sexually assaulted before her murder. Jan had three gunshot wounds to his head, which were all fatal. He also had bruises on his arms and abdomen, which were consistent with being kicked. The night of the murders, Kiana spoke with her mother around 8 p.m. During their phone call, her mother heard Kiana set the alarm to the house while they spoke. She texted Kiana good night at 9.47 p.m., but never received a response. The investigators began focusing on the military connections and looked into Marines who have worked with Jan. Two of his friends told him that he was a talker who liked to brag about his wife and the life they were building together. He also talked openly about his reenlistment bonus of 30000 and having lots of cash on hand at his house and plenty of wedding gifts. Though he was a friendly talker, he was also a strict sergeant when it came to his job and somewhat of a perfectionist. He rubbed some of the newer Marines under his supervision the wrong way when he got on them for not doing their jobs correctly. However, there was one name that kept coming up during their investigation, and it was Lance Corporal Tyrone Miller. He was one of Jan's supervisees who often butted heads with him. On October 24th, Jan and Kiana were buried together in a full military funeral with a 21-gun salute. Both of their parents decided to bury them together since they started their lives together and would always be together in death. After the recurrence of his name, investigators decided to bring Tyrone Miller in for questioning. He denied any animosity between him and Sergeant Pietschak and claimed he mentored him for the past nine months. At the time of their murders, he claimed that he was at home with his wife and two kids. However, once investigators applied more pressure, Tyrone started to expose more cracks in his story. Initially, he stated that he had never been to their home. Then it was he had been there months ago with his wife and then it turned into he was out with friends and they drove by the house about two weeks ago, which was around the time of the murder. When investigators asked what he liked to wear when he got together with friends, he said, you know, hoodies, baggy shirts, bandanas. When asked about what type of shoes he likes to wear, he said, probably Jordans and Chucks, Air Force Ones. These were all similar to the surveillance footage and the shoe prints at the scene. Investigators slyly let Tyrone go, but little did he know that they had enough evidence to get a search warrant to his home. The following day, they arrived at Tyrone's home and nobody answered the door despite people inside. Police were left with no choice but to ram the door in and enter the home and they witnessed Tyrone backing down the hallway towards the bedroom. He even grabbed his toddler daughter and held her up as a shield. Once he put her down, the police secured Tyrone and his wife and began searching the home for evidence, which took little effort to find. A piece of paper with the Piet Shack address was found under a sofa cushion in his family room. There were multiple blue bandanas, gloves and socks and a backpack with bolt cutters, ammunition, handcuffs, and a handgun magazine. They also found Jan's wedding ring, his blue uniform hanging in Tyrone's closet, and a gold bracelet with the couple's name inscribed, and the murder weapon in his room. Tyrone's gloves would later match Kiana's genital DNA, and the blue bandanas had blood that matched Jan. 
Tyrone was immediately placed into custody, and after an hour of being confronted with all the evidence found, he confessed. He tried his best to minimize his role and said it was only supposed to be a robbery at first with two other Marines, 18-year-old Emrys John and 20-year-old Kevin Cox. He claimed that he only took the ATM card and jewelry and that he beat the sh out of Jan. He also admitted to spray painting racial slurs on the walls to make it look like it was racially motivated. He denied shooting either Jan or Kiana and pointed the finger at Emrys John. Soon after, detectives brought Kevin and Emrys in for questioning. Kevin was an electrical technician in Jan's squad and Emrys previously reported to Jan but was transferred to work under Kevin months prior to the murders. Kevin tried to deny being present but then admitted to going to the Piet Shack home and said he was really f***ed up by the time they arrived and stayed in the car. He admitted though that it was him who rang the doorbell to get Jan to answer and turn off the alarm before he was ambushed. The next day, police searched Emrys' quarters for evidence. They found a blue bandana under his bed with black gloves and a backpack. They also found Nike Cortez sneakers, which actually had the same tread pattern as the impressions found on Jan's back from when he was stomped on. Blood spatter on the shoes would later match his DNA. Upon speaking with Kevin and Emrys, they also learned that there was a fourth Marine involved, 21-year-old Kashan Sykes. Kevin and Kashan admitted their involvement, but denied shooting the newlyweds. While searching Kashan's residence, more jewelry, including a two-piece wedding ring set, was found along with a laptop and Xbox with video games. Kiana's jewelry box was also found with Jan's watch. However, there were a bunch of other items with other people's names that were suspicious. It turns out that Kashan committed a different robbery a month before. A man named Eric Thomason, his girlfriend Nancy Balcombe, and their children were at their apartment when a young black man wearing a bandana over his face entered while holding a gun. He demanded that Eric get down on the floor on his stomach. Suddenly three more black men, one white man and a black woman entered the apartment. The group began to ransack the apartment for valuable items and asked Eric to hand over and guns which they believed he possessed. His girlfriend Nancy was actually in her bedroom when the group entered their apartment and was awoken when she felt someone touching her breast. When she opened her eyes, she saw a black man pointing a gun at her face. She was brought down the stairs to witness Eric being kicked, stomped on, and pistol whipped so hard that it broke one of his teeth. The group ended up taking his laptop, an Xbox, video games, Nancy's jewelry box, and 1500 in cash that they split amongst each other. The white man who was present in the September robbery was a man named Justin Weisinger. He worked at Camp Pendleton and befriended all four of the men in custody. He said that he was in custody for a different crime at the time of the murders, but when he came back on October 20th, Tyrone filled him in on the crimes they committed. He identified 18-year-old Emrys John as the shooter and mentioned that the group tried to burn the house down by pouring alcohol and some type of sugar mixture on the floors, but it just wouldn't catch. Justin discovered that the murder weapon was actually his handgun. Kevin's girlfriend, Melissa Buck, was also interrogated and shared more details of what happened to put it all together. She stated that the men left her apartment at 11 p.m. with intentions to rob the Piatschek residence. 
They attempted to sneak into the home, but when that wasn't working out, they sent Kevin to the door to see if Jan would answer while the others waited. Once he answered the door, they rushed him, quickly hogtied him, and put a sock in his mouth. They eventually did the same with Kiana when she was brought downstairs. The group went searching for money that they thought they'd find, but eventually gave up. They began torturing the couple until they got Kiana's pin for her debit card. Jan was then stomped on by the group. They transferred the stolen items to their car parked outside, but came back into the house. To make matters worse, Tyrone and Kashan began to sexually assault Kiana with the while Jan was made to watch. Afterwards, Emrys first shot Jan and then Kiana before attempting to set the house on fire to cover the crimes. When they realized that didn't work, they spray painted racial slurs on the walls to make it look like a hate crime. In a span of 90 minutes, the newlyweds who were only married for 67 days were tragically left lifeless in the living room. All four men were charged with two counts of first-degree murder, with special circumstances as the murders were committed in the course of a robbery and sexual assault. All pleaded not guilty and were dishonorably discharged from the Marines. The district attorney sought the death penalty against all four. The prosecution set out to show the jury the double lives these Marines had led. Soldiers during the day and criminals at night committing numerous home invasions and burglaries throughout the Riverside area. The preliminary hearing in the spring of 2009 had to be suspended when Kashan Sykes stood up in the middle of the hearing and began urinating and flinging droplets around the courtroom, claiming that he was trying to banish unseen demons. The judge ordered a psychiatric evaluation and after two hours, he was deemed mentally fit and the proceedings continued. All except Kashan went on trial as there was limited space in the courtroom. The findings were that Tyrone Miller was the mastermind behind it all, Emrys John was the shooter, and Kevin Cox played his part by getting Jan to answer the door so they could all gain entry. Jan's blood was found on Emrys' shoes, and the shoe prints matched the shoes all three owned. The prosecutor was also able to bring in the September apartment invasion and robbery that occurred a month prior, but no other robberies the group was suspected of committing in the area. One of the most shocking pieces of evidence was something that Emrys had posted on his MySpace page before their murders, which wrote, Chillin', waiting for the killin'. The court believed the motive was to get a big payoff by stealing the wedding gifts Jan had talked about and money they thought was in the home. Perhaps they also wanted to get revenge on Jan for being tough on them. In fact, two days prior to the murders, Tyrone testified that Jan told him that there was no chance of him being promoted to corporal because he didn't feel he had earned the distinction yet based on his performance. He said he went home and drank two bottles of hard liquor and wanted to speak with him about it that night. Except he took three men with him in firearms. Each defense tried to argue that their client played a small role in the home invasion and murders and should be spared from the death penalty. I go to the cemetery every week I have not missed in six years and I will continue to go because that's where I have to go to see my children. Jan Paweł Pietrzak was my life, my light and my precious only son. After four months of the trial and three days of deliberation, the jury came back with verdicts. All were convicted of first degree murder. Tyrone and Kashan received an additional conviction for the assault. All were sentenced to death except Kevin Cox, 
who received life without the possibility of parole. He likely should have never been spared as he showed no remorse, stating, I apologize for what happened to the victim's family. I didn't say I'm sorry I did anything because I still don't feel that I did anything to be here for it. He said he would appeal, all of which have been denied till the present day. The judge in the case called the murder savage and the most inhumane he had seen in his 27 years on the bench. Though there hasn't been any updated information on the case since 2013, I suppose all men are either carrying out their sentence or waiting on death row. May their time come sooner. May Jan and Kiana rest in paradise and their families find peace and justice. Thank you all for watching.